and we're back in with another podcast from the Financial Planning Association Conference. Uh, Danny, welcome back. Thanks, Fraser. And we have Brett with us this morning. So, welcome, you, Brett Wright. Thank you. Good I to actually, be here. Um, Brett was one of the first people, life insurance specialists, that I spent a bit of time with. We were at Hamilton Island at a we were. Macquarie Life Conference, actually. So, it's really nice to see Brett again. Brett, there's been a bit of time in between since we've spoken and, and some of our audience may not know your background. Do you mind just filling us in how you came to be an insurance specialist and what you're up to now? Yeah, so um, my dad started our family's life insurance advice business 35 years ago. Um, he gifted me an income protection policy when I was 18. I wasn't in the business at the time. I thought it was a shitty present. Can you say <laughs> shitty on a podcast? Yeah, absolutely um, can. I ended up... I, I don't know any 18-year-olds <laughs> that wouldn't think an income protection policy is a shitty present. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And um, he did explain it and said, look, you do risky sports if you hurt yourself and can't work you know, or never work again, I'm not paying for you for the rest of your life. So here's this thing, you know, just give it a whirl. I ended up claiming on it two years later. Um, I broke my hand, I had an accident benefit. Is that back in the day when you could get income protection policies for risky sports? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Thanks, Dad. Um, yeah. yeah, so I broke my hand. Uh, couldn't do the job I was doing at the time for six weeks. The policy paid from had a day one accident option on it. And I thought this was a pretty cool thing. Obviously, growing up hearing Dad's stories about claims and how he's helped people and things, I thought, I think it's time to join the family business. So, started as the chief photocopying officer, um, did admin for a couple of years, got into advising, and then just yeah worked my way up from there um, to where we're here now. Fantastic. Now, it's, it's pretty easy to dive straight into the uh, an, uh, an ugly assumption that you know a 35-year-old risk insurance business um, is quite traditional. No, yeah. Not so the case? Um, yeah, so when I first started, it was paper files. It was, and I got, I got annoyed with having to walk to the filing room all the time every time you had to do a bit of admin. And so pretty quick, smart, we transform, transformed it into a digital office and, um, you know, put technology in, when I say technology, so, you know, all the servers and everything to, to go fully digital, essentially. Um, there's still elements of the paper fact finds that we still did with clients in their lounge rooms and things like that but you know we had an electronic file mm-hmm. um, and then yeah I've always been interested in software um, did software design at school and um, yeah around 2012 2013 I thought oh, I'd like to build a little software product and it was when the CIS Act changed to have self-managed super funds need to uh, consider life insurances as part of the investment strategy so we built a little tool that plugged into BGL and class which is the mm-hmm the dominant SMSF administrator platforms and um, our platform did life insurance consideration for self-managed super funds at audit time. And um, yeah, so that, that went okay. It, it didn't grow and scale like we, we'd hoped it would and we pivoted that and expanded it out into um, uh, life insurance considerations that mortgage brokers could do, general insurance brokers could do, accountants could do and that went really well and, and that's where we, we really... You know, really hit the accelerator on the technology path. Mm. Yeah. So you've always been looking ahead, a little yep. bit of ahead of the time, and change. And you've actually had to get your hands into changing things and reinventing things, and all the processes and people yep. change that goes along with that. So it, it's you, you were on a panel session um, today at the FPA around the future and what 2030 looks like. Yeah. So you've had obviously yeah the vision, but then also you've had to get in and actually make the change process happen. What's yeah. the next? You're, you're sort of on a pretty exciting, yeah, new vision. Going to talk yeah. to us about it and what that whole panel was about. Yeah. So we, the the software that we rolled out to the accountants, the mortgage brokers, the GI brokers, let's call them referral sources, uh, made it really easy for them to have a life insurance conversation. And then when their clients wanted help, um, that it would hand over to the advisor and track and manage everything, and then keep the referral partner up to date in later years on you know do they still have cover and things like that. Um, but it solved a little piece of the big problem, right? The mm-hmm. Getting clients was one problem, but we have this end-to-end advice issue with cost to serve and complexity and inefficiency across multiple systems. And um, even though KPM was going really well, the businesses using it to provide the advice were still hitting the same issues I was in my business. So um, they, couldn't, they couldn't serve the demand or the average customer because the cost to serve and the compliance risk had become too high. So... Um, would sort of I'd always sort of wanted to I'd seen what Zero had done in the accounting space and um, always wanted to you know start 
thinking up a solution mm. essentially that could be end to end that does everything in one platform so that me as an advisor in my advice business, I don't have to use 10 or 15 different systems to get the job done. I can use one. Um, you know, consumers can have a really good customer experience digitally you know, on their laptop, on their phone and things like that and access advice really accessibly. So that's where LifeBid sort of started. Mm. Yeah. The zero for risk insurance. Is, this, uh, is that what we're calling it? That's right. We're labeling yeah. it now. So mm-hmm. what uh, yeah, what zero was for accounting, life, but is for life insurance. So, Fantastic. That's a good analogy. Uh, yeah. So, and, and I just want to know, where, where's the business at as, as, as of today? Before we get too much into that session, the, to, the, where are we going to? Where is the business at today? Yeah, so I think a really important part is that you don't just walk into the industry and have a solution and say, hey, Everybody come use it. It takes, um, and the industry issues at the moment are so deeply ingrained uh, across multiple stakeholders that it takes the industry to working together to solve the issues that we're facing. So, um, yeah, we've got a we've got a working group, six of nine life insurers. We've got a critical mass of advice providers, um, industry associations, licensees, and so we're attacking the problems from that compliance piece, that technology piece, the advice process piece, and. Um, and innovating and, and you know, that, that digital innovation and, and moving forward together. So, Yeah, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. And, um, and I'm just going to quickly throw it out there. If someone wants to find out a bit about that, how's the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, www.lifebid.com.au Perfect, yeah. lovely plug. Now, on to the session. Let's get into the Yeah, so uh, what did you share future. about the session? What do you see um, 2030 looking like, particularly from an insurance lens? Yeah, so... Or more broadly. Yeah, so I think um, particularly in insurance, so insurance is different to investments and super and retirement planning and, you know, the sexier stuff sort of thing. You know, you know clients just don't wake up and say, hey, I'm going to go buy some life insurance today. Um, I know that sounds old school, but it's the truth. Um, you know, pair of shoes, life yeah. insurance policies, I'm going the pair of shoes every time. That's right, yeah, yeah that's right. A bottle of Christmas gin life insurance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas gin. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And um, and I think it was really interesting, one of the stats that the Quality Advice Review quoted was that in the last four years, um, the, the amount of life insurance originated by with the help of an advisor. So clients taking out a policy with the help of an advisor has gone from 70% to I think it was 84%. Mm. So... You know, more and more people aren't trying to DIY. They're they're turning to advice to to get help with their mm. life insurance. So, yes, yeah, so I think that's a that's a trend that we can see evolving. And as we move towards twenty thirty, I still you know advisors won't be replaced. So I just see technology doing knowing what we're delivering at LifeBid, we're cutting costs to serve by ninety percent. I see technology doing the below the line stuff in a really streamlined fashion, and the advisors helping clients with the value add stuff. So. Understanding what's available, you know, adequately scoping, you know, picking out a great insurer that provides value and great customer service, and we have good partnerships with, and then being there for that renewal and that claim time as the, well. The thing that strikes me as you say that is, are there going to be enough humans? Are we going to have enough advisors? Yeah, so it's a good. So, in the session, the twenty thirty session, yeah, you know, there's a, some in, um, data, industry data that shows that. 75% of the new business at the moment is being written by 1,700 advisors. So wow. um, we need 17,000, 25,000, 30,000 advisors providing risk advice and we're not just going to do that overnight. <laughs> right? So we need to increase the capacity and the capability for who's already here to serve more people. So that's the premise behind needing to cut the cost to serve by so much so we can 10x the capability of the advice providers in the market to serve more people. Um, and so if you look at that 1,700 that writes 75%, then the remaining 25% of new business is written by about 5,000 advisors. So there's a dabbling. So we have a really schmick, easy, cost-effective, um, automatically compliant advice process getting the 5,000 dabblers back into more full-time risk advice. And then the other 7,000 advisors on the far that, you know, they might be qualified to do risk advice, but they're scoping it out or just don't want to do it. Scared, getting, maybe, maybe they're scared of it because of the complexities. Yeah, yeah, getting them back into the game as well and wanting to help more people. Because when you think about financial planning, life insurance is actually a pathway into financial planning. It's something that you start. Insurance is something that you start with when you're young, when you're having kids, you're buying houses, you're starting businesses, and then as your needs evolve, then you go, you get a bit more interested in your retirement. You go, I might, you know, get some investment planning and some super planning and. And things like that. So, um, 
yeah, it's about creating pathways into into risk advice and consumers getting access to risk advice again as well. Yeah, and, and getting, you know, I, I you mentioned that before about making it sexy because, um, you know, I guess if, if, if you've got university students coming through, they're thinking of advice, they're thinking of investments, they're thinking growth, they're thinking all these sort of things. Yeah, exactly right. It's, um, it's very hard to find a professional year candidate that wants to focus on risk advice, mm. essentially, so... Um, You're going to have to have a whole lot more kids to bring them into the family business if you want to 10x yeah, your advice well, I've for I've got two now, so I better start, yeah, better start going. Yeah. Better start buying some birthday presents. <laughs> that's, they, they, that's right, yeah. Here's your 10th yeah. birthday. Day. So, uh, your, little, yeah, little, here's your child young. trauma policy. Yeah, I'll uh, practice what I preach. I've got yeah. kids, kids trauma that will turn yeah, into yeah. an adult policy when they're right. 18. So, yeah. Yeah. so you're obviously dealing with the front end and helping, you know, the idea is to make sure that more people can get protected. A big issue for a lot of people who are writing insurance is the sustainability. Mm -hmm. So once the grudge has been adopted and they've done a whole heap of work of getting that purchase sold, then actually making sure someone can hang on to it because the premiums haven't escalated Mm. so dramatically. Do you have any views on that or do you see that as a future thing? That How how could we solve that as an industry? Because it is an industry problem as well. It is, yeah. So... um Best so life bid stands for life best interest duty. It's not bid as in a marketplace for insurers bid. It's life best interest duty. Um, and you know, a few people have said, "Oh, if it goes to good advice, you're going to call yourself life gar." No, we're not. Um, it's just going to stay as life bid. Uh, and the best interest duty will stay anyway by the looks mm. of it, by the proposals in the QAR. But where were we again? Sorry, the around the sustainability. Yeah, the sustainability. Yeah, because yeah. that's a real trust breaker yeah. for a lot of advisors. And I think one of the reasons they don't actually want to sell it because it's really hard to understand what. What is this yeah. um, future promise? The pricing going to look like on it? Yeah. So I think um, technology has a has a role to play in sustainability, mm-hmm. and I think you know best interest duty isn't just about the the best priced, highly featured product. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole lot of other uh, nuances that go into best interest duty around um, the customer experience, the ease of doing business, the the value that different that different insurers provide for different niches of the market. And um, I think if we're going to fix the sustainability issue, we need to get more younger lives into the pool because mm. we've seen you know, the under 35s just not getting insured anymore and they're the younger ones that we need coming into the pool. Um, but then also as well, that whole advice process, that best interest duty process, not just focusing on price and product, but focused on other value-add metrics yeah. that... Um, that are sustainable as well because you know there's no point putting in place cover if you're getting 20, 30, 40 percent increases every year. Now I imagine when your father started the business, that it was very much around that tight agency scenario. Where for those people that aren't listening to this, they don't know what that is. That means that a life insurance agent, if you like, worked for a company and their best interest was to make sure the pool was profitable, yep. as in that kept the premiums down. Uh, we moved to, speaking of best interest duty, individual, and we just had Bernie on, Mr. Best Interest Duty. Individual best interest duty, was, which was actually worked against the pool product yeah. um, because best interest for investment is is different to best interest for a pool product. Do you think that there could be a future where we, we go back to that conversation of, you mentioned the pool, but focusing on the profitability of the pool? And, and, I, and I actually think that you know with reserve levels and interest rates rising that we're going to see that. Ease because yeah. there's money there. But t- talk to us about the concept of the pool and, and, and best interest of everybody in the pool. Yeah, so yeah, the life insurance is a pool product. It's a pool of many, you know, looking after the unfortunate for the benefit of the community, the communities in our economy, and um, and the same goes for risk advice as well. So yeah, there's the fee for service, there's the commission argument. Um, you know, and reality is commission is pooled access to great advice and high quality advice and access to high quality products as well. Um, so I think it's really important that yeah, there is that difference there between investment and super advice where mm. you know, clients have the ability and the interest to pay a fee to grow their nest egg and manage this pot of money that they have. Um, but then life insurance is different where you've got people that need to cover the most often can't afford the advice to get into the pool and, mm. and pick the right, make the right selection in the pool. So um, yeah, I think we... Yeah, the, we do need the pools to be to be healthier, and um, we really do need to to drive technology to access that next generation in consumer. Because at the moment, the customer experience doesn't cater to the under thirty fives. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't cater to anybody really. Like it's um, yeah, the new business has been going down, down, down. So yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for coming in and chatting with us today on the podcast about the session. So many things we've unpacked. It obviously uh, yeah, the the future is. 
so many opportunities around the future, I think, with, with life insurance, just because of the supply and demand issue and, yeah. and being able to bring that to many, many people. And I love the fact that there are so, like, as we've been talking to many people over these couple of days, there's so many advisors who have been practicing advisors who've brought forward solutions to solve their problems in their businesses, mm. which is fantastic because there's no one who knows a problem like someone who's had to face that problem in a business. Yeah. So it's really, I think that's really exciting that technology is not just being made by tech companies, it's actually being made by advisors to solve their own business problems. So get in touch with Brett if you've got any questions. Yeah, love the initiative. Thank you so much for coming along. Thanks, Thanks for having us, guys. Cheers. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our mega, mega, mega mini series that we started off being a short podcast series, but of course, with, yeah. with quite a few podcasts going good on. Good ideas. They tend to great drag ideas. on. Great That's ideas. Great. Uh, from the Financial Planning uh, Association Congress, uh, Danny and I are joined by Cameron. Welcome. Thanks for having me. And Cameron is fresh off the stage. So, Cameron, you know, thank you for joining us. We haven't given you much of a break. My pleasure. Now, now let's start with a little bit about you. Do you want to introduce yourself? Let, let the uh, listeners know who you are and what you're doing? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so we set up a risk specialist practice about 10 years ago. Uh, so all we do for clients is risk-only work. So we don't do any wealth at all, um, which, uh, which ties in nicely with those practices who don't want to do insurance. Um, so we set the practice up uh, to fulfil the needs really of um, high net worth individuals uh, and SMEs. Um, so we do quite a lot of buy sell cover as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got uh, going on four planners at the moment in the in the group, um, and mainly looking after accountants, clients, financial planners, clients, um, and our existing client book. Thanks, fantastic. Where about to you based? Uh, based in Melbourne. Uh, so we've got an office in CBD Melbourne and one in Bo Morris. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and there's uh, and as you said, there's a lot of key person type. I love the key person of the risk mm. space. I think it's a great space to be in. Um, now you've obviously seen a lot of change over that time. Ten years in in risk business could be um, is a lifetime. Uh, it, the products have changed. The legislation's changed. The the, the 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 fee tables have changed. Do you do fees or the do premiums you, do, have changed? The premiums Frank. have changed <laughs> a lot. The, the pools have changed. Nothing's the same. No, look, I think most of the changes happened in the last three, four years mm. uh, in the insurance space. So um, when, you have, uh, uh, when you're having all these changes happening all, all the one time, so the LIF changes, product changes, um, how businesses are structured to fulfil client needs have also had to change too. Uh, so scale has typically gone up. We've seen a lot of businesses really scaling up to try and focus on this and, and still drive profitability in the right areas. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been um, a hell of a lot of change, but uh, I think those that have... Often reg-led, hey? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, look, it's it, a bit of a shame. Yeah, look, it is. Hopefully some of the, the reg changes with the quality of advice review uh, might actually throw that pendulum back the other way for us. So, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, look, it's, it's been challenging for many, um, and I think a lot of the practitioners that we're talking to today uh, who are multidisciplinary the challenges are probably even greater because it's perhaps an area of the business that uh, they haven't themselves addressed as to, firstly, is it profitable? Secondly, are we still good at it? Um, and is there a lot of risk exposure um, with regards to all these product changes that we might not be keeping up with? Um, and, and actually, do we enjoy doing it too? Because um, if you can spend that bandwidth on the wealth side of the practice, yeah. um, that's where the opportunities might be. Yep. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. There's so many things to consider. Now, tell us a little bit about the session today. Uh, tell us about the what it was about and, and, and what happened. Yeah, look, we, we, uh, we went through uh, really talking about that fork in the road for a lot of practices that, um, uh, that for, for all those reasons I was talking about a moment ago, either, either need to consider the whether or not they're upskilling and upsourcing, um, upsizing their businesses to be the right scale as well. Um, so that they can truly specialise in this space, or um, the alternative is quite the opposite, which is outsourcing and outsourcing to a risk specialist um, and focusing on fo- focusing that bandwidth I was talking about before on the wealth part of their business. It might be more profitable to them. Um, so there's a fair bit of discussion around that. A lot of a lot of discussion around um, the current climate, all the changes that are happening, um, all the pressures that are around at the moment. Um, some of the some of the small wins that we're having too. Uh, there are a couple what of wins there. What are the wins there. that people are excited about? Oh, look, I, 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 some of the some of the things we we're talking about, which I guess uh, uh, I haven't so much heard it um, in, in a, a more public way, but 
is that uh, uh, profitability for income protection is has turned the corner. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's looking it's looking like so whispers. There are whispers, whispers around corners that whispers. the profitability is profitability is returning, is re- yeah, um, right. which which has been driving a lot of the price rises and a lot of the heartburn for clients and advisors. Um, uh, lapse rates are down. Um, so whether whether any of it's artificial because of the product changes and a lack of change going on between the old and the new products, um, but nevertheless they're all they're, they're, they're good positive things. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you say around. Um, it's interesting what you say around the specialisation and all. One of the case examples that I've been privy to, and shout out to Phil Thompson, who's also an insurance specialist, he said, look, he was a holistic advisor doing all the things because he thought that was a more sophisticated business model. But when he took the step to that specialisation, and this can be whatever it is for a business, his profitability of his particular business has skyrocketed 10x because... Not only does he know his thing, he can also build processes around that particular thing. So the processes you can continue to refine because you're not always thrown in so many directions that there's not really a clear process. And for his referral sources, he was a bit nervous around making that change from you know broader offering to a more narrow offering. But for him, he's found despite that fear that his referral sources, either their clients or the people that refer him business, have been able to then articulate what he actually does because it's not everything and how do you, like, you know, and a client or a referral sources can't really sort of provide that breadth of what a financial planner does, like what's the actual benefit of having that person in your life. So, yeah, I think what you're saying around profitability and efficiency is, is absolutely um, an experience that I've heard. I actually met with uh, Phil when he was early days in his practice and he was holistic mm. and we talked to him about the specialisation piece in insurance. So he wasn't too sure, I think, at that stage. So I'll take credit to him going yeah, down perfect. the specialisation path. And I've got no no idea who Phil Thompson is. Uh, so <laughs> if you're listening, Phil, I hear get he's in got touch. good hair. Get in touch. Uh, you're absolutely right, though, about the, the focus in on, on businesses. Um, and being able to then, um, I think you hit the nail on the head then with referral sources because it's really important that they can articulate what you do. Yeah, 100%. So um, having a a, a clear um, position of difference uh, is is definitely a key. So And then it it gives them the confidence um, in, uh, you know, referring what we want is their best, the best opportunities. Um, So if they've got the confidence, we'll soon see their best opportunities and uh, they'll have really happy clients. So in the SME space, what is changing? Like this, your session was all about building an insurance proposition. What are the things that you see are either the biggest mistake that that um, people do within that that prop- that methodology piece, or or what's the things that have changed for you or need to be you know brought to the surface in the business insurance space? Okay, so in, in the SME space, uh, particularly with buy, sell, and key person, uh, it, it's it's often misunderstood, um, both at an accountant level, sometimes at a former planner level who, who may have may be good at putting policies in place but not necessarily strong on the strategy side. Um, so we're seeing some of the worst cases we've seen where buy sells have been structured through super, um, where we've seen um, all sorts of inadvertent CGT complications where there's all sorts of different purposes and nothing is documented. Um, so there's some of the messier ones. Um, at the end of the day, it's about just having a really seamless uh, exit um, in terms of that financial exit um, and that it's, it's at a sum that's expected. Um, it doesn't have to be funded off a personal balance sheet or the business's balance sheet um, and the business can go forward as business as usual as best as it can without any passive uh, investors being a, 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 uh, the exited partner's spouse or beneficiaries um, having a say at the border and table. So it's about that, that business as usual for the surviving partners. Now, one of the things I'm always interested in is the resources available. Now, obviously, with the risk specialists, how hard is it to find new people coming through to fill all the, all the spaces, if you, especially if you're increasing business or trying to grow your business? How, how hard is it to find yeah, it, it increasingly complicated. Uh, so um, I think it's a real challenge that the industry has, uh, and uh, it's it's still something that I'm grappling with. Um, we've we're, we're talking with a planner at the moment, and we're we're fortunate to be 
uh, have, to have had someone put forward to us. But uh, I think also as a specialist practice, you're naturally going to have the right sort of planners gravitating to your firm too. And that may, maybe that's just a, a side benefit of, of specialisation. I think it's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because you're sort of, I say to people when they're marketing, if they say what they do and, and, and they focus in on the one thing, then they will attract people that are in their space. Yeah, agree. Yeah. yeah, people don't buy confusion, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Although we're good at it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming in and chatting to us about the session today. Straight Pleasure. off the stage, just really appreciate it coming straight down and onto the onto the podcast mics. Mm. It's been uh, it's been great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Good morning, still everyone. We are day two at the FPA Congress. I'm Danny. I'm representing XY, and the XY team and the FPA are making sure that the people who couldn't attend the sessions today still get those ideas and nuggets of gold so they can embed and improve their practices. Now, I am joined by a trio. So this is going to be a fantastic chat. I've got three aged care specialists who did a session yesterday at the FPA on aged care and really shared with other advisors what makes that a really rich conversation and, and, you know, their tips and tricks because I can imagine you've all been around in the FPA world and also as advisors for quite some time. Yeah, see nodding heads. So I'll get I'll get the trio to introduce themselves, starting with you, Kerry, and who you are. How did you come to the FPA? And then yeah, we'll move on to the other guests. So I'm Kerry Darden. I am the founder of Clarity Financial Advice, and I specialise in aged care. So I just help people understand the financial implications when they're moving into care. So I work with other financial advisors within the FPA that are doing investment and product advice and I just help them as a specialist to address the aged care component for their clients. Fantastic. Hi Jason, welcome. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jason Burley from Burley Aged Care Advice. Uh, I'm also strategic aged care only Mm -hmm. and uh, I don't provide any ongoing advice so it's all uh, fee-for-service effectively and uh, I, because there is no ongoing clients and no ongoing income, I'm always on the lookout for new business mm-hmm. and, uh, and I do that by a range of marketing opportunities around the region. Okay. And hi, Asad, how are you? Did I pronounce your name correctly? Asiat. Asiat, yeah. there we are. So I'm from Aged Care Steps. Uh, we support Kerry and Jason and other advisors to deliver aged care services for their clients. So we provide accreditation training on aged care, which is a foundation for the FPA's uh, specialist aged care specialist designation. We provide software, tools, and, and other support, technical and, and practice development support to help them build and implement their aged care services. Fantastic. So give, we're, we're doing a little 10-minute chat. So it would be fantastic uh, for the people listening to share, I guess, the things that what might help them in those aged care discussions like what was your panel on and then we'll dive into the what can they take away and and improve what they do so what we were talking about in the panel was we were covering off a range of the different issues that advisors often think about when it comes to aged care everything from addressing some of the misconceptions they may have about what business models they can choose um, and identifying that they don't necessarily have to be an aged care specialist, but we do think they need to have the aged care conversation with clients. We touched on how you would price for strategic advice like aged care. Um, we also touched on issues such as how do you start the aged care conversation with clients through a range of different means um, and went through a case studies to illustrate the value of advice. And the good thing was that Kerry and Jason could then uh, provide the practical insights around those issues. So can anyone provide any tips? You know, you talk about opening that conversation. When you're working with someone who's not a specialist in this area, what are the tangible things that you help them do? So there's three things that I think um, to start the conversation Mm -hmm. is most important. And one of the things I suggest to advisors is turning the family tree conversation upside down. So they talk to their clients about themselves and their wife and their children and what their goals and objectives are. They very rarely talk about their parents. So turn that tree upside down and occasionally ask them about what their parents' um, health is like. Do they think they're going to help, have to help their parents in their later years and how that's going to impact their cash flow because if they have to take time out to do that or whether their parents have um, the means to pay for their own care. 
The second thing is that when they're doing the investment plan, to have the conversation about do you think that you're going to have to stop work or your wife's going to have to stop work? So that's going to impact how much you've got to invest over a period of time. And then it can also highlight whether there's going to be potential inheritances and investment opportunities in the future. And the third thing is that we all talk about um, estate planning and the importance of having EPOAs, um, mm-hmm. enduring powers of attorney in place. So asking the client do you have an EPOA in place, but then taking the next step and going, are you EPOA for anyone else? So the other thing is that I don't use the word necessarily aged care. I talk about the later years in retirement. People don't want to talk about aged care, but if you start talking about what does that look like in the last 25% of your retirement, it's a much um, easier conversation to have with clients. And I can imagine it's a huge release particularly if someone is looking after a parent who who is is deteriorating from its health perspective. I mean, that responsibility and that workload can fall on someone who is not in those years of, you know, their later life, but they're having to deal with all of those realities. And and I guess that's the scenario we we certainly see a lot about in XY and those conversations. We have an ethical committee and it's really interesting that a lot of the ethical conversations – are those scenarios where someone does need to go into some level of care and what do you do and how do you navigate that and and what are the outcomes? So I guess it's it's never really a straightforward conversation, which is why you specialise in that. Yeah, it's not a straightforward conversation and if you ask anyone, they want to stay in their home. The reality is that they can't always stay in their home, so have the conversations about what that looks like and how you're going to plan for that going forward. Um, most of the people that go into aged care don't want to go into aged care, mm. and yet aged care homes are full. So yeah. at the end of the day, there's a necessity, yeah. and there's kind of you can ignore it, but time the clock's ticking. So mm. um, further to what Kerry was saying about how to get uh, how to get aged care in the conversations, what Kerry was talking about is really with the client base, and uh, another way of where I've been looking at it is to try and get myself known well in the region. I'm in a regional area and so I want people to know that when uh, aged care is a need comes up that I'm known. I'm either known to the person themselves or to somebody else that they're talking to. And I do that by, you know, effectively a monthly editorial that Aged Care Steps provide. I put that into a local uh, free magazine, go out to see the solicitors and accountants, other financial planners, uh, meeting at aged care homes, uh, some of those will refer, some of them won't, mm. and uh, yeah, a number of different regions. Matter of thinking outside the square, and so that way you can actually get more aged care clients as well than mm. out of your existing client pool. Yeah, and I guess the other thing is making people the value for. I guess the community then is that they're understanding when they when this big event happens that's very life altering yes you know where do i go for help so i guess to have that in the even if you don't specialize in the conversation or don't want to and you want to outsource that like having that um support team to be able to just offer as a solution because yeah i guess the clients might not know so the thing that i'm interested in and i don't know if this is this is perhaps not what you covered in your session but elder abuse is a really interesting conversation that's mm-hmm. starting to emerge more and more and I, and it's been something that i've been asking kind of you specialize in you know perhaps later year planning have they come across it what do they do when if they suspect it it's a very awkward sort of conversation to host is this a topic that has come into your realms or something that you've had to deal with and do you have any tips for those advisors out there that might suspect something isn't quite right and then what do I do next what do I say so um, I have lots of conversations with enduring powers of attorney about making sure that they're acting in their parents best interest because sometimes I'll be sitting across the table from someone and they're saying mum wants me to have this car it's like she doesn't have capacity you have a power of attorney, that doesn't mean you can spend her money on a car. So having those Mm, conversations and referring them back to, you need to get a legal opinion on what you're trying to do. I think ASIAT probably could address this from an age care steps perspective. So interestingly, we we often talk about when age care decisions are being made, um, we talk about the fact that a lot of the emotions drive the decisions and we to refer them as the three G's of aged care, which is that they that the person might be going through a lot of grief, 
um, a lot of guilt, but also greed is the other one. And this is where elder abuse comes into it. Um, and sometimes the abuse may not be – financial abuse may be um, – Something that they're not even aware that they're actually doing or they don't recognise it as that. For example, they might say, oh, look, I think that mum should gift me uh, or my children $10,000 because that's going to help her Centrelink uh, um, age pension entitlements. But when you look at it, it's not really giving away $10,000 in order to earn $500. Is that really in the best interest of the client? And so it's certainly an area that advisors need to be always on the lookout for and addressing. Um, sometimes the, the concern becomes that if you're talking to the child and you address the fact that there is elder abuse, the risk you take there is that the child of the p- uh, person may say, you know what, I'm going to go to another advisor. Yeah. Um, and so therefore it limits what you can do, but it is still something that, that could be reported. Yeah. And that whole $10,000, it's like, is it really worth losing the access to that money um, for a very small benefit? It's all case by case. And, mm. and really, like, I'm, I'm so mindful of my clients, which are the people going into care. So that's something to keep in mind that you might, like, I don't meet the majority of my actual clients. I, I, have, I meet their partners or I meet their children. Yeah, great and point. typically... Um, I'm yet to have any elder abuse in, or have not picked up any of it whatsoever. But also, and I think the reason for that is that when I'm having my initial chat with the clients, um, it's pretty clear that where my focus on, and is most people aren't going to pay my fee to, in the hope that I'm going to help them rip off their parents yeah. or whatever. So really, uh, if you're into aged care and as specialists, I, I don't come across it, yeah. and uh, but I'm always mindful of it mm-hmm. because it's a very easy trap for people to fall into and sometimes like that 10 grand it might be fine they might have 300 grand mm-hmm. okay if you want to give as long as it's coming from the parents and not being driven yeah. by the children i guess advisors would perhaps if they're having a broader conversation and they're hearing what a client mm-hmm. who is aging is is you know they might suspect within the broader family network things are happening Absolutely. and that's that so i guess bringing in someone to your point earlier around you, well, you might not want to broach that subject in fear of losing the client, bringing in an independent person to make, perhaps explore that scenario and have those deeper conversations might be a really helpful way to go. But also, so. would you want to have a client <laughs> that's ripping off their parents? No, I'm talking about like, but so I mean, they, may be the, they may be dealing with the parent and, and yeah. understanding that there's something going on in the broader unit. But that in, is infecting, yeah. In terms of bringing that up with the chance that these people might go to another advisor, well, so be it. Mm. <laughs> you know, good yeah. luck. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I'm not suggesting I, that you wouldn't bring it up because you risk losing the client. Exactly. I'm just saying that what, what often happens is when you do bring it up as an advisor, mm. the client reaction may be, oops, I better get out of here. And so that's, mm. that's what they end they're up trying doing. To that yeah, as opposed client. to that. Yeah. I, I do have conversations about divesting. I don't agree with divesting to get greater benefit from the government because it gives you less options and less Mm. choices. So it's educating people that, yeah, it sounds great that mum can give you the money, but it's then limiting mum's access to the care that she needs and it's her money. So like Jason, most of my clients, you would not go through what you have to go through to get someone into care and sit in front of me and talk about aged care if you didn't um, really yeah. care about the person you're with. So we're probably lucky that our yeah. clients aren't elder abuse clients. Yeah. Um, no, I just I just wondered whether you'd seen that because it's a question yeah. that we get from the yeah. from the cl- the advisor who's dealing with perhaps the person who's receiving those perhaps poor advice choices. So yeah, it's a, it's a different relationship. You would think that we would have a lot of it, mm. given that's all we do is aged care. Yeah. But for mm. those reasons, we actually mm. don't no, it's so good too. much of it. And, and look, what, what are the, sorry. I've spoken, I've listened to um, the Guardian, Queensland Guardian speak okay. and some of the stories about elder abuse are horrific and you would need to report it if it came across your desk. But I've been fortunate enough that the people that I deal with care for their parents yeah. and they're looking for the best care they can get. Fantastic. And sometimes one of the best things you can do to um, address that is to pre-plan ahead for aged care. So don't wait for an incident when the, when the person going into care doesn't have capacity. If you can try and, as an advisor, sit down with your clients and their families and pre-plan and put, put some ideas and strategies in place, then that really reduces the overall risk of, of um, elder abuse as well. Mm. Fantastic. 
Well, thank you all for joining me. It's the first time we've had three people in the podcast seats as guests. So thank you so much. Asiat, oh, did I get that right this yes. time? Fantastic. Jason and Kerry, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Danny. G'day, Clayton here from XY with Danny and a special guest who's flown all the way over from the UK literally just to get on this podcast. That's uh, it. It's, it's the it's, only reason I'm here, Clay. <laughs> it's Nick, uh, the founder CEO of Intelliflow. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Uh, when I was in the UK in June, I actually, the only time I left London was to go to your offices in Wimbledon. And because um, you've got a fascinating story and the fact that we kind of uh, get a chance to go behind the scenes a little, I'm pretty excited about. So, um, so, so Clay, I'm now realizing that actually now you said the date you came to us in, in, in Wimbledon. Yes. You're just like everyone else who only comes us to Wimbledon to visit us in June, July, a fortnight <laughs> in that summer. Everybody, they all do it. It's, it's the same thing with the Australian <laughs> Open, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Early yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, so, uh, what on earth got you into financial planning advice tech? Oh, long story to that. So, so we built uh, an original technology solution. This is way back in the late 90s. Cool. To operate across something called the internet. Now, it, may, it, might be, it might be new to you. It was certainly new to everyone back then. And we built this CRM workflow and document management capability and thought, wow, this is going to be fantastic. Yes. About a week and a half later, I read through um, some, some journal. As when journals were actually like, you know, yeah. paper and you, yeah. you used to read like that. About this little company in the States called Salesforce, who right. were also doing that. Right. But Larry Ellison had invested like 35 million bucks in them or something. So I thought, right, okay, we're not going to do this generic <laughs> CRM workflow stuff anymore. Let's right. find some vertical market industries. Awesome. And the second one we found was financial advice business. And it was really, uh, and, and it's, uh, well, firstly, the first one was the legal businesses. And that was a real nightmare, to be honest, because they were so backward about technology. Yeah. I went into a training session. We were a tiny business at the time, just three people, I think. Uh, and it's at that stage of a business when you wear all the hats. You, we, we all know that. And oh, yeah. It's kind of cool as well. And you too. answer the phone as yeah, different people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you do. Yeah, 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 just, yeah, no. yeah, I'll hand you over in a few seconds. Yeah, yeah. I'm here now. Yes, that's fine. Clayton's yeah. also been Kathy in my previous life. He, he knows it. So I sat in this room to train our first legal client. And it was a big sort of boardroom type desk. And there were six people all around. And there were monitors in front of them. The monitors were quite big in those days. This was before all the sort of the flat screen stuff. And I yes. said, right. It all operated on Windows at the time. And um, I said, right, okay, first thing to do, we're going to start the application. So if you're just using your mouse, click on the icon in the top left-hand corner of the screen. Right. Pretty simple, right, you'd think? Yeah. All six of the people I was training at that point in time picked their mouse up and hovered and pushed it onto the top left of the screen. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, this is going to take a long time. Oh, in the That's late 90s. That's how backward it was, yeah. I'm not going to say the firm name because if they ever <laughs> listen to this, I'm screwed. Um, but yeah, so financial advice, was the sec uh, financial advice business was the second firm we, right. we spoke to. And the technology in the UK at the time was just dreadful. It was sure. really dreadful. So yeah. we saw a huge opportunity. Yeah. And then I started finding out over the next few years, actually what, you know, a financial advisor was because I didn't know right at that yeah. time. And started understanding the value proposition, the difference they made. And ever since there, I've been, uh, you know, I've been a huge fan of financial advice as a profession and what it does and what it means to people. Yeah. And if we can empower those advisors to be better, yeah. more efficient, deliver advice to more people, that's a pretty good outcome. That is a great, uh, yeah, that mission is essentially why we exist as a company as well. Yeah, yeah. To, to drive the positive evolution of financial advice because of the impact that the uh, profession has on um, the everyday person. Um, so where does, at what stage, so late 90s, early 2000s, you're picking a niche, you're going after the financial planning market. Um, at what stage, and this you'll let me know uh, how far ahead we're skipping, but you've also emanated a bunch of, of companies into where you are now. So when did, when did that become a strategy uh, rather than just say, because it's build or buy, right? It, yeah. it, it's always build or buy. So at what stage does buy make more sense than build? Um, 
buy, I think buy always makes sense if what you're buying actually is complementary. The technology is well aligned. So it's not just, so there's two bits here. There's the functional thing. Mm. Actually, there's three bits. There's the functional bit. So what does the actual capability of the software do? And does it complement what you're doing very, very well? The second bit is, how's the technology even been built? Because how it's built actually determines very much whether you can actually integrate it seamlessly. And we're all about joined up user experiences, whether it's for the end client, for the advisor, power planner, whoever it might be. So you need that, that real technical alignment. Yes. And you'll be amazed at how many technology solutions that are out there that aren't well technol- well constructed. Yes. Because um, it's easy to build software now. It's not easy to build great software. Yeah. Um, so that's the, and then the third bit, which is probably actually the most important of all is culturally. You know, what's the team like? What are the people like? Are they going to, are, are you all going to work more effectively together? Yes. Um, and sometimes that involves acquiring where sometimes some people don't fit the mold and that's okay you know that's if, yeah. if, if 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 they can be part of the journey that's great but those kind of people sometimes don't find a way and that will move on to something different and that's fine too so nick you say something interesting there there's a difference between technology and great technology it's not that hard to build technology but great technology there is a big technology race mm-hmm. In the Australian market, what have you identified as, as the really important value adds for the advice businesses? Like, what have you what have you analysed is the important thing that your business has to nail to create advocates? I think I think it's a similar. It's, it's not just about the Australia here either. I think it's the same challenge that is happening in lots of other countries around the world. It's definitely happening in the US. It's happened and it continues to happen to a certain extent in the UK, and that's where technology grows and grows and grows and gets to a stage where it actually becomes less useful than it was originally. It kind of loses its way. 100%. And that's, and that's challenging for software businesses because they've got to work out how do you innovate and change. And if you think about it from a software business perspective, a lot of the time, a lot of the challenges they have is all their technical engineers are telling them, we need to rewrite stuff on this latest cool technology because that's, that's what we want to do and that's why we're in this marketplace. You've got to complement that with realizing that actually the software itself what it does what it's there for actually innovates and evolves too because it all has to evolve and this marketplace is changing at the same time so how do you do both of those things and i think you do it in two ways i think you do you first you have an open open api structure so a total open architecture is about how things should work in the marketplace because ultimately our customers are financial advisors and their, their clients are the end investor, you know, whoever they may be. The, the advisors want technology that works and does sometimes some quite niche things. And sometimes that means they'll be taking their, their they'll be utilizing software from third parties. Mm-hmm. But that needs to integrate with the, the whole. And you can't just say, look, okay, we're going to build a bad version of that, but it's at least it's our, our version. <laughs> it's tick the box. Yeah, yeah, you can't do that. So you need to enable that, that to happen. And, <laughs> and we found, you are, you, your original question, Clay, was about how we brought businesses together and when it was. Yeah. One of the businesses we brought together started life as a, as a store partner of ours. So they built an API integration to us. We put them on our marketplace. This has been running for sort of six years or so in the UK now. Wow. And that business was doing really, really well. And guess what? We saw that it was doing really well because we got perfect access to the data. Yes. So we started talking to the team. They're a great bunch of people. Yeah. And said, right, why don't we do something together on this? And that, that's what started the conversation around, around corporate. So that's one part of the strategy, which is that open bit. The second bit is you also have to, I think more increasingly now, you have to understand that user journeys have to be really well joined up. And it's, mm. it's for all of the actors in that place. It's not just the advisor. It's not just the client. It's not just the power planner. It's all three of them working, working in, in, in perfect harmony. And that sometimes means you do need to build new stuff yourselves. Now, if your architecture is solid, and for me, I'm an unashamed multi-tenant SaaS fan, God, that sounds horribly geeky now I've just said it. But <laughs> You're going to have to break that down. <laughs> I'm going to have to break that down. So SaaS, software as a service. So Salesforce is, is probably the best example of a multi-tenant SaaS. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, actually, all it really means is that you've got a single version of the code. Yeah. So if you look at us today now, we have a single version of the code in Australia, the US, and the UK. We make 18 to 30 changes a day. Whoa! Every time one of those changes goes in, it happens 20 milliseconds later in the next two regions. 
So that means we've got a single version of the code. Okay, there's regionalization on top of that that makes it yep. sound Aussie or sound UK or, 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 or whatever and talks to, to, you know, um, has, has the right kind of parameters set up there. Yes. But ultimately, it's still a single version. So that means whenever we make a change, we're only changing to one version. The death of software businesses is lots and lots of different versions of your software everywhere because it becomes incredibly difficult to support. Yes. That's what the cloud introduced. They yes. introduced that single version. Back in the old days, people used to get CD-ROMs or before that tapes even <laughs> and had to update things, but they wouldn't update and they'd get it wrong and then you'd have support problems. But it was a huge revenue model for tech companies to customize their, their technology for each client. Yeah. And then when SaaS came along, the business model shifted. And so it was no longer, hey, pay us an extra few million dollars and we'll make it just right for you. That It killed that business model. Yeah. And, and for companies that were dependent upon that business model, it's been a huge impact. Yeah, a huge impact. Yeah. And, and I mean, we see that a lot. We talk to a lot of institutional um, firms who've built their own software yes. or paid a third party to build the software for them. Yes. And, you know, they spend tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever it is. And guess what? Three years later, they realize they've just rolled it out because it probably has taken three years and it's out of date. The yeah. moment they launch it, it's out of date and it doesn't do what they need to. Totally. So then they might start again and start with another one. But with SaaS, you know it continually evolves. Yes. That's actually the deal. That's the contract you sign with your SaaS vendor that they're going to innovate and keep updating the software. Yeah. If, they're not, if they don't do that, they're not really SaaS. Yeah, fair play. I, I the reason I was asking originally around the the M and A um, uh, because uh, obviously you guys have come into Australia after some substantial success in, into the UK. Um, my first thought was when you mentioned that it's um, you know customized for each country or each territory. My first thought is in the UK when you open up the screen, does it say, "Oh, we lost the ashes again"? Oh. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, um, so how, how did the football game go? Uh, this week, sorry. Anyway, uh, uh, yes, yeah, something's <laughs> happening. Oh, hi, that person over there. Um, so, um, so my question is regarding uh, the U.S. Right. So, um, is U.S. Ha Obviously, the, you know, for us as well, like the reason why we've changed from XY Advisor to Ensemble is because we're moving over to the U.S. and U.S. big market. Um, is it, are you, uh, the, the uh, strategy is UK, Australia, US, or is it Australia, US at the same time? Um, how, how, what's the rollout? What's the rollout strategy? It's all three at the same time because we've wow. still got loads of, we've got uh, lots to do in the UK as well, you know, Respect. so we have a decent market share, some yep. 45, 46% in the UK, but there's still a way to go. We're bringing new innovative products to that marketplace too, yep. which also will come into Australia and, 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 and the US too. It's ultimately bringing all of those, uh, all of those markets up at, up at the same point in time because they're all at, whether you look at them from a technology perspective, they're all at slightly different stages. If you're looking at them from a marketplace and the profession, the advice profession, yeah. you know, I think you know, the US advice profession is changing and they've got a, a way to go. That's really, really interesting. The technology in some respects is pretty good out there and two of the businesses, sorry, three of the businesses actually that are part of the group now, part of the single group, are US software businesses originally. Wow. And so a lot of our digitized account opening, money movement type stuff, which is, is stuff that we've got in the States, is also now going to come into, into, into Australia and the UK. Awesome. So you can just see how all this stuff starts complementing each other. We want to continue to do that, continue to innovate on, 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 on what we've got already. Yeah. Um, it, it's a very interesting point that you make. It is professionalism is increasing in financial advice around the world or yep. simultaneously as is the expectation of what software delivers. One of the best lines I've ever heard, uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll attribute it to the author, is Matt Hein from NetWealth who said, um, people expect the same technology experience that they just encountered and more often than not, it's Google or Facebook. Yeah. And so when, when someone's coming from that environment, they need to keep that standard, right? Like totally. it's, yeah. And so what I, what I like about your uh, strategy and the way that you're talking about how it's rolling out globally is that w the standard exists and it's our job in our profession to meet that standard and, and that standard is, 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 is you know, unanimously uh, desired globally. So that's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're not just the little backwater, um, you know, uh, y y y that, you, that you're being nice and saying, oh, look, we'll, 
we'll give the Aussies a, you know a couple of little bits of software before we move over to the US. It's very it's nice of you to to, to even um because because the industry is a lot smaller here compared to the UK or the US. So um. I, do you Nin- lo- 95% of the stuff we build yes. is the same in all three territories. That's wild. 95%. 5% of it is that configuration layer across the top that makes it a little bit different for each market. Sure. And because we have an open API structure, actually integrations with things that are proprietary to a particular territory are just done by the third party with our API. So we don't, yeah. actually, we don't actually have to do the coding work behind that either. So that... You know, that's, uh, into, to be fair, that's the kind of the Salesforce strategy as well. You know, they've, they've grown up through a lot of cap- capacity and capability that they haven't had a thing to do with. Yes. They've just provided a, a, a framework to do it. Yes. You know, back to your point of, of, of the, the kind of the advice journey, when I look at it, there's, there's, and we, we did some research on this. You've got the kind of, if you think of that new client advice journey, you've got onboarding. Yes. You've got the advice itself. And yes. then you've got the implementation of that advice. Sure, yep. what, whatever it is. When you do the, the con- consumer research, the bit in the middle, the clients really like. They like the advice bit. It's highly personalized. It's telling them something about them. It's, yes. it's, uh, in, it's an interactive approach. Yes. And they're coming up with it, or your advisor is coming up with a plan that you think will, will help you in your future life. You know, yes. Whether that's your immediate, immediate lifetime or, or your retirement or whatever it might be. They love that bit. They hate the onboarding because they have to go through something called fact finding, yeah, which actually isn't fact finding. Very often it's guess finding because you're asking impertinent questions of a client that they don't really know the answer to. So they're going to make some of it up. Yeah, technology takes the strain from that and actually makes it become really interesting. Yes, and then the implementation bit, and this is to your point, it's just terrible. It is an actual terrible experience. These are, you know, we're all used these days to buying something from Amazon where we just click a button and that's it. 100%. And sure, some stuff happens in the background, but as far as we're concerned, transactions concluded. I press the button and I know because of Amazon Prime, it's going to arrive tomorrow or same day in some place. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that, that's incredible. Yes. Financial advice isn't like that. That implementation bit across various platforms and other, other third parties is really rubbish. It's really rubbish. And that's the stuff that we want to improve. So when we go from like, obviously, that's the meeting of the standard. Yeah. Looking for when, when does it come to a point? What would you like to see where you're exceeding the standard? Like what does the next kind of five years where you go, look, instead of just catching up and providing that experience that's been set, do you think that uh, advice will ever be technology-enabled advice will ever be in a position to go, we're actually setting the standard. Wow. Like, what does that look like? And is that would five that be great? Day? It would be Wouldn't so, but why isn't it possible? It's, it's, of course, yeah. it's possible. Come on, Nick. Of course, yeah. it's possible. Technology can do pretty much anything, so long as you've got the time and the money, unfortunately, to actually build that stuff. And that's one part, again, back to, it's not, Australia's definitely not a backwater for us. It's because it's this single strategy. Actually, yeah. it doesn't matter where people are sitting, you know, whether they're in the US, whether they're in Australia or they're in the UK, they're still using exactly that same technology platform. So all we're doing is we're just getting more people onto that. And the more users are on there, that actually helps us fund, you know, the stuff we're doing. We, the next level experience. Yeah, exactly. And that next level experience, I think, is going to be, you know, it, for me now, mm. this is all, this entire marketplace in everywhere around the world, by the way, is about client experiencing, that experiences, those wow moments. Yeah. As, a, as a client, you want to have wow moments with your advice, you know, because it's incredibly important to you. So why shouldn't it be wow moments? It, we, we owe it to clients to make these wow yeah. moments. It's almost the outcome that's wow, but if you can bring that, that front journey to that same level, though, yeah. what they experience in four years' time of working with an advisor, that's the huge opportunity yeah. That, yeah. that advisors would love uh, yeah. from what we hear. Awesome. Hey, Nick, thank you so much for uh, jumping into the podcast uh, and sharing with us. It's been great. Loved it. Cheers. Absolutely love it.